and a big part of my population is the Medicaid population. The reason I'm running for Secretary of State under the Green Party is because we absolutely need electoral reform in the United States and particularly in Oregon. We need a ranked choice voting <clears throat> and campaign finance reform, the amount of corruption uh, from legislators, particularly in, in industries like the timber industry, is notorious across the country. Uh, Oregon is ranked one of the last states in terms of campaign finance. Um, and that needs to change. So I'm just here to uh, challenge the status quo. And uh, the Green Party draws as much from the Democrats as from the Republicans, because we tend to be very fiscally conservative. We invest our money where it makes change. And the other reason is, of course, uh, the, uh, the Secretary of State sits on the land board and issues of uh, land management are paramount, particularly uh, during cl um, climate change. So that's basically in a nutshell to make it short. Thank you, um, Senator uh, Fagan. Well, hello. And before I get started, I just want to acknowledge the incredibly difficult time that we're all going through after these wildfires. And I know that so many folks across the state have family and friends. And so I just wanna say, I hope that all of you and your loved ones are safe. I know that we had a level one evacuation, which didn't cause much disruption, but as scary as that still was, I know that a lot of folks have experienced this in different ways. And I know that we all share a heartbreak for our neighbors in Oregon who have lost loved ones and homes and beloved pets and irreplaceable belongings. And so I just wanna start with that. And I can certainly acknowledge that seeing little towns like Talent and Detroit and others essentially be burned to the ground has been eye-opening for me because I grew up in very similar little towns in Wasco County, the Dows and Dufer. My mom battled addiction and homelessness for most of my life. And my dad raised three kids by himself in those little towns. And we were hanging on by a thread, it's fair to say. And the summer before I started second grade, my dad took us on this really cool two-week camping trip. And I remember vaguely catching crawdads and uh, roasting marshmallows and sleeping in a big family tent. And it wasn't until many years later that my brothers told me what really happened, that we'd been evicted from our home in the Dalles. We had nowhere to go. And so we were homeless. Well, my dad didn't want us to know, so we took us on a camping trip. And so that's why I've spent my career as a civil rights lawyer and as a legislator fighting for other Oregon families that are hanging on by a thread, passing legislation like paid sick leave, raising the minimum wage, but also making sure that we knock down barriers to participation in our democracy from automatic voter registration to campaign finance reform and expanding vote by mail with prepaid postage. But when I announced my campaign for secretary of state, I quickly learned that most people have no idea what this job is. <laughs> One of my brothers, who's a diesel mechanic said, secretary of state, so you'll get people's coffee. So whenever I'm talking about this office, I always like to start there, that this job at its core, in my view, is to make sure that government is working for everybody, from running elections that are fair and secure, to auditing state revenues and programs to make sure they're making a real difference in the lives of people who need them most, running public records to make sure that government is transparent and accountable, running the Office of Small Business Assistance that I helped create my first term in the Oregon House, and this year in particular, potentially having a very strong role in the redistricting process. And I would use an independent nonpartisan commission to ensure that all Oregonians have representation and that we embody the sacred value of one person, one vote. So as Secretary of State, I get to ensure that government makes a real difference in the lives of everyday Oregonians, and I'm excited to be running. Thank you, uh, Senator Thatcher. Sorry, I was trying to unmute. It's a little trickier, different than Zoom, which I use most of the time. Um, yeah, I've got a, a good combination of private and public sector experience that can relate well to the Secretary of State's office. So I've spent, you know, most of the, my last 
well, 29 years in this community representing basically the same constituents during that time, barring redistricting. Uh, but much of my focus has been on things that relate directly to the Secretary of State's office, whether it's uh, th through you know, the audits committee serving on that, longest serving member of the Legislative Audits Committee, or dealing with uh, business issues through the business committees, um, also um, looking at public records and serving on the public records advisory council, bringing forward the transparency website. I've been working on and focusing on good government issues and bringing accountability and transparency and integrity to our government so it does work well. And I've also been a business owner for 28 years, which uh, with you know plenty of employees and, and lots of moving parts, managing budgets, dealing with things that would also apply to the Secretary of State's office. and um you know being able to manage that agency and knowing what it's like to uh, deal with uh, some of the things that small businesses have to in the state which led me to starting in 2011 even a couple of years before my opponent was in uh, office working on getting an advocate for small businesses and um, now that is housed in the Secretary of State's office, thankfully for that bill that was passed in 2013, it was a bipartisan bill and we need that more than ever to help get Oregon back on track. And uh, you know, much of my focus and interests lie in this office and this is the type of uh, nerdy type office that I, I really would <laughs> do well in and this, I'm really running to serve Oregonians and be that nonpartisan person, not putting my thumb on the scales when it comes to applying election law and uh, trying to implement the law even handedly and, and doing my best there. Sorry, now I'm having trouble with the unmute. Okay. so. Um, so I would like to take the conversation from there um, there to follow up on questions I sent to uh, uh, both senators, Senator Fagan and Senator Thatcher on on the audit. Um, actually, let's back up a step. Let's let's talk about the answers that you gave this week on the um, on whether the vote would be fair. And I think I'm getting a little bit of feedback. If you could mute yourself, if you're if you're still unmuted. Okay, so um, Senator Fagan, Senator Thatcher mentioned that she think there should be a, she thought there should be a revision to how, what ballots are counted, that any ballots that are postmarked the Saturday before election day should count no matter when they arrive. Is that something you support? I support that. Unfortunately, I think it has to be a statutory change. I looked into this pretty seriously before the May primary, which is when the stay at home orders were much more strict than they are today and learned through legal analysis that there is actually a statute that allows, I believe the mechanism is that the governor tells the secretary of state that they need to expand, but the statute requires them to expand election day under the statute. And the legal analysis that I performed and had reviewed is that that would mean literally November 3rd would no longer be election day, which means under Oregon law, we couldn't even count ballots until later in the week. And folks could also drop ballots at drop boxes until whatever date the secretary of state had expanded election day to. So for this election, as much as I support, I, I support changing the law so that postmarks count. If a ballot is put in the mailbox by election day and postmarked by election day, it is a counted ballot. I tried to work with Senator Canope, my Republican colleague in the Senate on changing this for one of the special sessions. And we simply couldn't get agreement that that would be on the docket, but I do agree. But for this particular election, I don't believe there is a statutory authority for that to happen. It would require a legislative change. And why couldn't you get agreement on that bill? And it seems like there was concern, you know, uh, from sort of the Democratic side of the aisle about whether the U.S. Post Office was going to be functioning. Well, I think those fears have died down a little bit, but why couldn't you get agreement when those fears were at a peak? The a special session is different than a regular session. We can't introduce bills as legislators. Only the leadership can introduce bills. And there was simply in, in not an interest from the leadership 
to allow kind of anything beyond these very narrow budget topics to be considered in that session. So it wasn't a lack of support for the idea. It was simply a lack of willingness on leadership to open up the session to anything beyond these narrow budget topics. And because it's a special session, I didn't have the ability to actually introduce a bill. It had to be introduced only by leadership. Okay. Um, so uh, the, 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 the follow up, the second question I asked both of you, um, and since you're not muted, we'll start with you, Senator Fagan, was the, um, what, um, what agency would you audit first as auditing is part of the job? And you both said the employment division. Um, so I want to, and I think you're, you're, that's a fairly clear why that is the agency of the hour that needs attention. Could you, could you explain what your second choice would be after the employment di division and why? Our emergency response, which I would have answered the same thing back in August before these wildfires, but now the wildfires need to be included as I'm sure that you have read, there's reports of folks down in Southern Oregon, literally not even receiving the warning. So they didn't go from a level one to a level two to a level three evacuation. They went from zero to level three evacuation. And we need to audit our emergency warning system. We need to audit our emergency response. There were a lot of folks with livestock who I've talked to when I've talked to uh, folks at the Clackamas County Fair who, they were expected to leave their livestock. And as someone that grew up in rural Oregon, uh, folks are not gonna leave their livestock behind. And so we need to have a much more efficient system for folks in rural communities when facing wildfire to have a place for them to take their livestock because a lot of these folks are not gonna leave their animals behind. So I think our entire emergency management response with respect to COVID and the wildfires need to be reviewed because literally lives and people's most precious belongings are, on, are at stake. Thank you. Um, Senator Thatcher, um, can you, what is, what, after the employment division, what, what would you focus attention on? What's your priority? Second well, we, we can do multiple audits at the same time. Uh, I do think that the forestry division needs some help getting uh, the money into their, uh, man, into their agency so they can properly manage things like they they are owed a lot of money from the from the federal government and that needs to be billed i know it's a very complicated process um they need some help there i would agree that the emergency uh, management needs to be looked at but i also think that schools and we have about four and a half billion dollars of uh education funding a year uh what's happening with that is it getting to the students are we helping those students who really need in-person uh, you know, help with their school. We're, we're one of the very, we're one of the minority of states that actually is not having in-person classroom time. Um, in Detroit, there was, and I'm talking about Detroit, Michigan, they were uh, starting a first day of school. And I think the, the article said that there was a, just one person, one kid had logged in um, do, are we keeping track of attendance? Are we making sure that our kids are getting what they need to be able to uh, succeed? And so I would really like to have uh, that looked into and make sure that our schools are providing the services they need to and doing their best. And that I know they're doing their best, but I really think there might be better ways of, of uh, executing our distance learning and uh, taking care of these kids that are disadvantaged and have um, you know special ed needs and really have need for in-person class. Thank you. Um, Ms. Parvagini, uh, do you want to, let's go back to the question that I didn't ask you before, which is um, we uh, the question of, do you think every Oregonians, uh, every vote in Oregon will be counted in this election? Do you have confidence in this in this election? In our, will you have confidence in this these election results this November? In general, Oregon has a pretty good system to count the votes. I think that it is unfortunate that uh, nationwide there is a campaign to suppress the vote and to decrease the capacity to um, cast your vote. And I think that Oregon and um, our institutions need to do the utmost 
to make everybody every vote count. I don't think that in Oregon there's such a huge fear that our votes will not be counted. It is uh, a concern that a lot of people who are displaced may not be getting their ballots, and that must something must be done about that. And I do agree that the emergency management needs to be reviewed, particularly with infections, because a lot more information could be gone out um, to keep people healthy. I'm talking from a naturopathic perspective. Um, thank you. So our, I want, so part of, part of the job um, is overseeing elections and um, you're both members of, uh, all three of you are members of party. Can you demonstrate for us um, that you will be able to be independent of party and, and a fair arbiter of elections? Um, let's start with you, Senator Thatcher. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Excuse me. I think it's very important that the elections officer doesn't put their thumb in on the scale of uh, whether they like a ballot measure or a person and shouldn't be um, weighing in on whether um, you know, this ballot measure should be approved or that one if it does not relate directly to the office. Uh, I imagine I will be ticking off peoples on all sides of the aisle to try to bring forward an even handed way of dealing with election law and applying it in such a way that it doesn't matter who you are, who you vote for, what you look like, what you believe, all those things are very uh, important to me because I have been treated differently by an agency because of who I am and, and what I believe in. So I know what it's like to um, get that. So I'm very sensitive to that and want to make sure that 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 partisanship is not there. Um, I've gotten, um, I didn't put Republican for state Senate or a, a, for, for Secretary of State on my signs because I'm not looking to be, you know, a one party, uh, you know, representative in the Secretary of State's office. I want to be Oregon Secretary of State. I have worked across the aisle on many issues that deal with good government. And that includes putting the transparency website online and, uh, just dealing a lot with those other good government type people who are in the Senate. I think that this is something I've been promoting from the beginning, even during my primary, that I'm looking to be nonpartisan. Can I, let me ask a couple of follow-ups and I'll do that with all of you. Are you, are you endorsing candidates or measures right now? I am not endorsed candidates or measures other than ones that deal directly with the secretary of state's office, such as, um, dealing with campaign finance reform and dealing with, uh, I had endorsed the measure to uh, adopt an independent commission for redistricting. And I publicly endorsed that, the, you know, near the beginning of my campaign. Um, those are types of things that I would weigh in on, but I'm not going to weigh in on uh, uh, ballots or, 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 you know, initiatives or topics that have nothing to do with the office. Are, uh, are you attending campaign events for candidates or measures? I attend campaign events that have to do with me being able to present my side of uh, you know, what I'm trying to do. Um, you know, campaign kickoff events that where I can speak and try to meet people and encourage them to vote and promote my own campaign. Yes. I, can you can you explain a little? Uh, so I understand you appeared at a at a uh, a cruise for Trump kickoff, uh, like the, the campaign kickoff event. Can you explain how that fits in with what you've just said to us? I think you're uh, referring to a Douglas County event. It was billed as a campaign kickoff for candidates. At that event, there were. Well, I heard three speakers. Um, one was a candidate for Senate and then myself and um, another candidate just talking about elections. And then I left. It was not billed as a, a Trump rally or anything like that. I, would, I didn't participate in the, the cruise, which was the people driving through town with all their signs supporting. I was not part of that. But I was there to promote my campaign and meet people and uh, encourage, them, encourage them to vote. 
Um, so, and one other question for you, and then we'll move on to another candidate. But if you're trying to demonstrate that you're going to be a nonpartisan, you know, um, arbiter uh, of elections, why kick off your campaign this spring, earlier this year? I'm not sure it was spring yet. Uh, at a Timber Unity rally. Well, I don't see that as a partisan organization. I know that there's members of all kinds of parties that work there. And um, I was just out in, the ca in front of the Capitol and that's where I announced it. And I have people from, I wanna say both sides of the aisle, but all sides of the aisle who are supporting my campaign and, and did so during that time. All right, thank you very much. Um, let's move to uh, Ms. Parvacini to our original question of how would you um, be independent from an independent arbiter? Given that the Green Party does not have the same stakes than the Democratic Party and the Republican Party in Oregon, it goes without saying that um, we tend to be much more, um, we tend to promote much more wider participation particularly with ranked choice voting and similar uh, electoral reform. Um, we don't have the same stakes and the Republican and the Democratic Party have. We work very closely also with the Working Families Party, the Independent Party, the, Pro the Progressive Party of Oregon. Um, we see one of the tenets of uh, the Green Party is grassroots democracy, and we're very strong with that. And particularly, we don't take corporate donations, so we are really very grassroots. Within our party, we have a lot of dissension because we believe in, in grassroots and in participation, white participation. I think that uh, particularly with the issue of redistricting, um, Oregonians can be much more secure that we will be much more impartial and objective in taking decisions in Oregon. Thank you, <laughs> Senator, Senator Fagan. Um, uh, can voters trust you to be a um, nonpartisan arbiter of elections? Absolutely. Issues like supporting voting rights and making sure the government works for everybody, these shouldn't be partisan issues. And I would say that being nonpartisan goes much further than not, you know, putting a thumb on the scale at the time of elections. I would say that it goes to not try to suppress votes by choosing who your voters are through voter laws. That's why I was proud to support automatic voter registration in Oregon, which the data has showed has really benefited a lot of rural areas because a lot of those voter registration drives were happening in more metro areas by groups like Planned Parenthood and others, but they weren't happening out in rural areas. I was proud to support prepaid postage on ballots, which definitely benefits rural areas who are much more likely to mail ballots than in the metro areas where drop boxes are used much more heavily. So I think that being a nonpartisan secretary of state is a lot more than just saying at the moment of elections, I won't put a thumb on the scale because of course you won't. That is corruption and illegal. <laughs> but it also goes back to not parroting lies from the president about voter suppression, not making accusations of people voting twice when we know that is simply not an issue here in Oregon. And so I think it's a lot further than administratively not putting a thumb on the scale, which is illegal. It also goes to supporting expanding voting rights and making it and knocking down barriers to democracy and participation here in Oregon. So are you saying that one of your opponents has parroted? The lies of Trump on on uh, whether elections are fair. Um, and in a recent interview with, I believe it was the Oregon City Rotary Club, Senator Thatcher and I were asked the question, "What have we done to expand voting rights in Oregon?" And she talked about, you know, ensuring that people don't vote twice, which is certainly something the president constantly talks about. Back in 2016, um, she told the publication she she. You know, identified Oregon's vote by mail system as quote plague, not something that we would want to spread to other states. And so I think it's important that no matter who is making misstatements about our electoral process, that you don't parrot those because the data is that claims of widespread voter fraud are a myth and they are a myth perpetrated by people who want to make it harder for certain people to vote through voter suppression laws. And I think it's very important 
that we have a pro-democracy Secretary of State who has a track record of things like expanding vote by mail, uh, ex automatic voter registration. We were the first in the nation to do that. Um, so before I come back to Senator Fagan, I want to give Senator Thatcher a chance to respond directly to those. Are you, do you think vote by mail should or should not be expanded to other states? And if there are other ways you want to respond to what Senator Fagan has said, please go ahead. Well, it's interesting she would talk about choosing your voters. And I think that the the redistricting process very much has to do with that. If you keep the partisan process that's in place right now, where legislators are basically choosing the line. Sorry, I want to cut you off and then, to answer the question of do you think- Well, okay, and then okay. parroting lies. Uh, there were people who have been referred to the, uh, to the attorney general's office for having voted twice because um, there is a, an, a, there's a system where we can tell if uh, voters have voted within, there's an agreement with other states some other states on whether a person has voted in both elections in both states and that has happened and i do think we do a pretty good job with uh, with vote by mail but expanding it nationally when it took us two years to get up to to uh to speed making sure that we had the process right uh and then just expecting it to go out nationwide within just a few weeks i think does ask for some problems we have good security, but we don't know what we don't know. We need to look at every level of this, the elections process and make sure we're not uh, leaving ourselves wide open to any sort of problem. May, you know, Look at it through the eyes of a, a white hat hacker, if you will, to make sure that we've got the best security and the best system in place and that we are, are very accountable and uh, fair in our elections and transparent in how we operate. Senator Thatcher, I don't feel I have understand your position to, uh, totally. I mean, maybe I do. Let me see if I understand your position on expanding vote by mail. You don't think it can be done securely in time for the November election, or you did not when you answered that question. Do you think it should and could be expanded to other states in a, a you know, over over multiple years? Thank you for letting me clarify. Yes, I absolutely think that because of Oregon's experience in vote by mail, we would be able to serve as a as a as a mentor and actually be able to uh, teach other states lessons learned and and some of the things that we've discovered. I th absolutely think that we could uh, be a model for other states, but just not in a, this short period of time. That's all I'm saying. Thank you. Okay, and and how many? how many people have been referred for you know judicial involvement for voting twice in our elections well that just for that particular thing i think there was it was fewer than 100 i don't have the exact number in my mind so do you believe that our vote by mail system is more susceptible to fraud than other than other forms of voting? You know, I don't necessarily believe that. I think that e even in-person voting can be um, susceptible to, 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 to fraud. And so we just need to make sure that people have confidence in their elections and that we are constantly monitoring and checking and looking at every step of the way. So we do have the best process. Okay, um, let's go back to Senator Fagan on... Uh, could you explain what your what steps you're taking to assure people that you are going to be nonpartisan? Are you similarly not endorsing candidates? Are you endorsing candidates? Are you attending candidate uh, events for other candidates? What what's your policy in this campaign? Uh, I'm going to answer that question. First, I want to give you the information you were looking for. Secretary Dennis Richardson, the first thing he did when he became Secretary of State was actually stand up to the Trump administration's claims of people voting twice in Oregon. He performed an audit of our 2016 election and found 48 instances out of over 2 million ballots cast. And he assured the Trump administration that our vote by mail system is secure here in Oregon. So I just want to put that uh, that on the record from Senator, or excuse me, from Secretary of State Richardson, the late Secretary of State Richardson. Um, I am endorsing candidates if I'm compelled to, because the bottom line is we're all gonna vote regardless of whether or not 
were endorsing those candidates. So secretly supporting somebody is not any different if you're worried about someone putting their thumb on the scale than overly endorsing someone. And so I am proudly supporting Senator or Vice President Joe Biden and Senator Kamala Harris. And I think that it's simply, you know, folks may not agree with me, but I think that they have a right to know where we stand. I'm, I'm, I'm not endorsing measures openly, but if you ask me how I'm voting on them, I'll tell you whether we agree or disagree. I think it's important for people to be frank. And, and I want to note that that this Douglas County Republicans event that Senator Thatcher says she didn't know it was a Trump event. If you look at the Facebook page, it literally says cruise for Trump and then it lists her as a speaker. So I think it's hard to say they didn't know it wasn't a Trump event because it literally said Douglas County Republicans cruise for Trump. And then I also think it's interesting that Senator Thatcher is claiming it's not appropriate for someone running for secretary of state to endorse candidates. And yet she sought and received and advertised the endorsement of the Republican appointed secretary of state, Bev Clarno, who will oversee this very election. So if it's not appropriate for people running for secretary of state to endorse candidates, um, it's interesting to then go and seek the endorsement of the sitting secretary of state and advertise that in your voters panel. I think what's really happening is Senator Thatcher doesn't want to admit that she's supporting Trump again. Um, understandably, he's not popular in Oregon. I'm sure some of the measures I'm supporting maybe are not popular in Oregon, but I'm going to be clear with folks and be straight by where I'm at. So in respect to your question about what I've done to be uh, nonpartisan, I, I've given you examples of expanding voting, even when it clearly benefits folks in more rural areas. P prepaid postage on ballots uh, definitely benefited folks in rural areas that are much more likely to vote by mail. Um, I have talked openly uh, in disagreement with the Democratic Party of Oregon that I support open primaries. I believe that part of the values that make me a Democrat is that I believe in expanding voting rights. and. I think that there is an era of Republicans, the Mark Hatfields, I'm currently rereading his biography, the Tom McCalls, but today the Republican National Committee is spending over $20 million in 41 separate lawsuits to stop the expansion of voting rights across this country. So these things shouldn't be partisan. We should all be able to agree. I think automatic voter registration is a great example. Sadly, that passed on partisan lines in Oregon but it has now passed across the country. I think we're up to 15 or 16 jurisdictions that has been signed by Republican governors. That is a very nonpartisan piece of legislation that sadly was made partisan here in Oregon because Oregon Republicans didn't wanna support that. That doesn't make it partisan just because other people oppose that legislation who happen to be Republicans. Okay, uh, Senator Fagan, another kind of, uh, another question on independence, this one focused on you. You just received a sizable donation from the governor. The job is to audit agencies that are under the governor's leadership. Um, how should voters expect you to be independent from the governor after receiving that kind of donation from her? Yeah, I think that her donation joins a large coalition of people who have supported me in this general election, including the Democratic Lieutenant Governors Association, a national organization, Emily's List, um, Nike. So I have received a broad coalition of support, Senators Wyden and Merkley. You know, I was on an event with the governor recently and uh, after she had given me this contribution because she supports me, she knows what it takes to be Secretary of State. And I was asked, what's the first agency that you would audit? And without hesitation, I said, the Oregon Employment Department, what happened there is unacceptable. We have to find out what went wrong, how we fix it, and how we make sure this never happens again. And that was with the governor. Obviously, that's an agency that her office oversees. You'll see that in my voters pamphlet statement. We'll be advertising that in, um, in our other materials. And so she understands this job. She also understands that the very first time I met her, was in 2013, the first time I sat foot in the Secretary of State's office, was when I met with her and other voting rights advocates as we mapped out the path to passing automatic voter registration in Oregon. So as somebody who initiated that policy as Secretary of State and then signed it into law as governor, incidentally, um, we, we very much see eye to eye on expanding the voting rights of people here in Oregon, making sure that we have one of the highest registrations in the country and then continuing to do things like prepaid postage and other pro-democracy reforms to someday have the highest voter turnout in the country. Okay, so 
this is something that definitely works in person. We're going to try it on our Google Meet call. It's a speed round. If you would all, it's it's a yes or no or a one word answer um, to these questions. If you'd all take yourselves off mute, we'll see if the sound quality can handle it. Um, <laughs> You're brave, uh, Rachel. <laughs> The first question is climate change, real or no? Senator Fagan. Real. Uh, Ms. Parvicini. Very real and Sen very hot. Senator Thatcher. Real, irrelevant though. Uh, yeah, I, I would say I would say that's fair. Um, I think some of your views on larger issues are relevant to this because the job involves being the uh, potentially being governor if the governor becomes unable to be governor. So I am going to ask you questions that are not directly relevant to the Secretary of State's job on the basis of that. Um, uh, so uh, Senator Thatcher, are Antifa violent extremists? Can be. Uh, Ms. Parvicini. They're not. Senator Fagan. Some of them have engaged in violence, yes. Uh, so uh, yes or no, are they violent extremists? Is a group of a bunch of violent extremists? Is that to me? Yes. I mean, it's not a yes or no. I don't want to characterize an entire group. Clearly, there have been destructive acts of violence committed by folks who identify as Antifa, but I'm not going to paint an entire group okay. of people. Okay, did did Antifa set the wildfire, any of the wildfires in Oregon? Senator Fagan? No. Uh, Ms. Parvicini? No. Senator Thatcher? Don't know. You don't yeah. know, okay. Uh, who are you voting for president, Senator Thatcher? Irrelevant. Um, it, does that mean you won't answer that question? Just like I said before, I don't think I need to be publicly endorsing candidates or measures that don't directly relate to the Secretary of State's office. Um, who are you voting for, for president, Ms. Parvicini? I will vote for Howie Hawkins because in Oregon it doesn't make that much of a difference voting Biden or Trump. Senator Fagan, you've already said. Uh, um, do uh, do public employees employee unions have too much influence in Salem, Senator Fagan? No. Uh, Ms. Parvicini. No, but I think that money is property and not speech, and we need campaign finance reform badly in Oregon. Uh, Senator Thatcher. Yes. Okay, next one. Is the Democratic Party engaged in a conspiracy to commit child abuse? Senator Thatcher. No. I, I'm sorry that this sounds like a ridiculous question, but unfortunately we have people who believe that running for office in Oregon based on that belief. So Ms. Parvicini. Oh. Senator, no. Senator Fagan. Absolutely not. Okay. Senator Fagan, uh, should should there be a philosophical exemption to school vaccinations? No. Uh, Ms. Parvicini. <clears throat> Not the philosophical exemption. Medical exemptions, yes. Senator, uh, Senator Thatcher. Depends. Uh, d uh, and the last, uh, well, the last of this speed around for Senator Thatcher, do you plan to be vaccinated for COVID-19? Not sure. Uh, Ms. Parvicini. I have to HIPAA here because I have actually medical conditions that okay. can be aggravated. So this is actually not a good question. I okay, apologize. fair enough. Senator Fagan. Yes. Okay. All right. Thank you. We can all go back to muting a little. That wasn't terrible. Um, so let's start with you, Senator Fagan. Uh, uh, grade, a grade. Can you, would you please give a grade to Bev Clarno on her service in office? I'm talking letter grades. B minus. Like school. What? B minus. And why is that? 
there's been a couple of instances, one in particular where three ballot initiatives were rejected because she claimed they did not follow the constitutional single subject matter. And I don't you know, discredit her because they were overturned, but what the Court of Appeals found that there was an obvious unifying principle in these ballot measures, which, which is to manage forests. And so I think that that decision to reject those ballot measures, particularly in conjunction with the reporting from OPB and the Oregonian about the Oregon Forest Resources Institute, and the fact that they pushed their report to come out right around the time that those ballot measures were coming out, I think is is unfortunate. And so I think that that was a really unfortunate decision to to, uh, and I'm glad the Court of Appeals overturned that decision. Uh, Ms. Carvaccini, what grade would you give the current Secretary of State? I agree. Uh, I don't think that the Secretary of State should be influencing elections with questionable decisions. Uh, Senator Thatcher, what grade would you give her? You know, it's funny. Um, I was just going to say C because I think she's doing the things that are expected. I don't see her going above and beyond and continuing some of the things that uh, Dennis Richardson had put in place. But I also have to question, it seemed like a, a big rule change at the end for people gathering signatures on the on the recall, which made it kind of made it very difficult for them to put that together. And it was kind of a last minute thing. And that was very, that was very frustrating. Um, could you give the uh, Senator Thatcher, we'll start this round with you, what, what grade would you give the governor? Sorry, I don't know if you heard me. Senator, uh, Senator Thatcher, could you grade the governor on her? Oh, sorry, I did not realize that was to me. I guess I didn't yes, hear you. Um, right now, I would, I would say D. Why is that? Only because, you know, I agreed with her at the beginning of uh, the COVID crisis when we we didn't know what we were dealing with yet. We needed to kind of like put a pause on things to make sure that, you know, we had good information moving forward. And it seems like now uh, at the beginning at what I'll just go back to the beginning. It was about not overwhelming our hospitals and having people die because they couldn't get the hospital care because there would be just too many people coming into the hospital system. And then since then, we've gotten more information and there, the, the goalposts kind of seem to keep moving as far as uh, what we can do to open up what's good, what's bad, what's what, you know, got businesses that, uh, of one kind that can open over here, but then 100 feet away or, you know, 100 yards away in another county, the same business can't open. There's just a lot of gaps. I think we need to really uh, move, be moving forward with good information, make sure that these um, uh, government or the, you know, the governor's edicts and, you know, the executive orders and, and that are, that they're working. And because as we move forward through time, I don't think this is the end of these sort of emergencies. We need to make sure we're doing it right. I would like to make sure that they're having the positive effect that they're supposed to and that we're using good science behind it. Uh, do you do you think schools should be open at this point? I think there are there are situations where schools can open safely. They can they can do um, I think they're an essential business, if you will. I think it's possible to do things safely and bring into bear the uh, safety measures that have been deter determined to make a difference, you know, the hand washing, the distancing, the, the masks, whatever it is, schools can accommodate that. There are, there are things that can be done, just as I think our capital should have been open during session. We, we can deal with these things. If, if, if Home Depot and Lowe's and Costco and all those can be open, we can, we can do it in our schools. We can do it in other businesses. We can do it at the capital. Thank you. Um, Senator Fagan, can you give the governor a grade? I would give her a B plus. I think that on the COVID crisis, I would give her a strong A. I mean, I get it. Folks are frustrated. It's difficult. But we have consistently had one of the lowest death rates in the country. She has made extraordinarily unpopular but necessary decisions about mandates um, on masks. And I think that Oregonians' lives have been saved as a result so I think it's I think it's hard to prove a negative. I think it's hard to prove who didn't die, who didn't get sick, who wasn't hospitalized because they didn't get COVID. 
Um, but any of those folks whose lives have been saved could have been anyone on this call, could have been a family member of ours, could have been a friend or a loved one. So I think she has done an extraordinary job uh, managing the crisis with uh, an unprecedented situation at a time when there is, you know, massive pushback from her, as, as Senator Thatcher noted, a recall campaign going in rural counties. This has been a really, really difficult situation to navigate. And I think that I'm, th I'm, I'm glad that my family has been safe. And I credit a lot of that to unpopular, but necessary rules like a statewide mask mandate. Uh, so why is she down at a B plus? Well, her? I think the Oregon Employment Department issue is, is, is a knock. I think that we and this is a time when I don't think it's so much during the crisis as before we have very, very low unemployment in Oregon. That would have been a time to upgrade computer systems, make sure that in the event that we ever had a massive influx of people needing those benefits. I mean, there was so low unemployment in Oregon leading up to this crisis that the unemployment claims per week were so de minimis, that would have been a time for that agency, the leadership of that agency to be able to actually you know, make those changes that would have allowed us to weather this particular time better. There are still Oregonians waiting on their unemployment benefits. And this is not just a safety net service. This is a payroll tax that folks have paid into their entire working lives. And for many families in Oregon, this is the first time they've ever needed to use it. And suddenly it's not there. And while I am glad that we have a, an eviction moratorium and a, 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 foreclosure moratorium, both of which I'm the only person running who supported those. Um, you know, people don't get a grocery moratorium, right? Safeway and Freddy's still require you to pay. And there are folks out there that don't have the money that they need. And I'm glad that she made changes at the agency. I think that's why it's still a, a B plus. Um, but I think that, you know, that's something that we should have taken care of sooner. The legislature had allocated money. Um, and, I, and I've been very clear that I will audit the Oregon Employment Department. Thank you. Ms. Barbara, you agree, the governor. I would uh, give uh, the governor a B. I think that she has um, risen to leadership position and really uh, addressed an unprecedented event like COVID <clears throat> very aggressively and very successfully. I do think that as time went on, there needs to be more flexibility and more consultation with the locals to be able to rekindle the economy. And there's been a lot of inflexibility about that. But I have to say that if from the White House, we weren't getting <clears throat> very um, confusing messages about basic public health, like wearing a mask, which is definitely not an imposition, but public hygiene, we wouldn't have the controversies that we have now and that it is really the leadership at the very top of the White House that has created a lot of the conflict and a lot of the uh, um, inefficiencies in the response nationwide. I think the governor has done a really good thing and needs to have more flexibility. I do believe that uh, there's been a history recently of uh, government agencies that have failed, like the Oregon Health Authority, the Employment Authority. So there must be a, a reckoning and uh, an increased increased audits and professionalism at that level. Um, so if, uh, so let's take this in a different direction, but we'll stay with you. Um, what what should be the max, you mentioned this before, but what should be the maximum campaign donation for future statewide races if uh, Measure 107 passes? The maximum campaign? Yeah, what, what would your preference be for what a candidate in a future Secretary of State's race could accept? I think we should have a program to match small donations. And I think that money or the, the capacity of one person to give should not influence so much the elections. So I would, I'm much more in favor of something like $500, for example. And corporations are not persons. Money is not speech. Money is property. So eliminating a corporate donations is paramount to having a functioning electoral system that's not influenced by big money. Uh, oh, Senator Thatcher, are you supporting Measure 107? And do you believe, I mean, is that, I assume that counts within the Secretary of State's purview as an elections officer? 
for the state. Yeah. Let me know if you're not going to weigh in that. But uh, do you have no, no, I'd be fine weighing in, but I'm wondering why I can't go last every once in a while. I, you know, oh, 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 sorry. <laughs> have I have I have I been not <laughs> making you go first? Apologies for that. Um, do you want to go first, Senator Fagan, on this one? Or I'm second, I should say. Uh, do you what do you do you support measure 107 and what do you think the maximum campaign donation is? I'm definitely supporting 107 again because of course I voted for SJR 18 to refer it to the ballot and the maximum statewide contribution limit for I mean I, I think it makes sense to do something akin to the federal limits to eliminate confusion. I think the most important thing that I'm concerned about, I agree with what Natalie had to say about uh, I me. Mean, I, I think what she was partially describing was public financing of campaigns, which is something I would love to see, but that's not obviously what we're looking at here right now. But the biggest concern that I have about a contribution limit that is too low is what we see in other states is it essentially drives campaigns out into independent expenditure land. And that may happen in some instances anyway with any campaign limits, but the candidate, the one thing that only the candidate can do that no independent expenditure can do is to hire and pay their campaign staff. And it's very important to me to provide all of my campaign team with health insurance and to only use paid interns and paid interns that are the equivalent of at least $15 an hour. And so my concern is with a contribution limit that is too low, it's really, really hard for a candidate to even raise enough money to have a full staff where they're paid a living wage, health insurance, and only using paid interns. Um, essentially, candidates might be on the phone constantly calling for donations instead of chatting with the Willamette Week or uh, researching issues or doing other things that we want, or talking with voters, listening to voters, attending events, other things we want candidates to be okay. doing. And so I think that the, the, the federal limits, I think for me, are probably right in the sweet spot, which we just make it consistent. Senator Thatcher. Thank you for that. You know, I think it, I don't have the answer for that. I know that it would be good to put together a citizen group, maybe a multi-partisan group, if you will, to uh, make make that level right. I know that it, if they're not set right, it can end up advantaging incumbents and disadvantaging challengers, and especially minor party challengers. and. Um, first and foremost, transparency is, is very important. We need to make sure that we are showing where the money is coming from and uh, being clear on that. So yeah, we don't wanna push things over into uh, in-kind donation land or where people are just, you know, putting together, you know, fake websites to help people without really revealing where they're coming from. Those, those are important, but I think putting together a citizen commission so that we have, uh, we can get that answer from all the various stakeholders and I don't have the answer all by myself. I just think we need to be, uh, make it simple and easy and um, not disadvantage one group or another. Uh, so, and are you supporting measure 107 or no? Yes, I am. I am in favor. I voted for SJ 18 to okay. put it on the ballot. And I think this is something that Oregonians are really in favor of doing. Okay, uh, next question on campaign donations. Senator Fagan, who's your who's your uh, biggest donor and what do you owe them at this point? Well, I don't owe any donors anything to start off. Um, I am trying to think, I believe I've received $50,000 from the Democratic Secretary of State's Association and they have pledged another 50,000. So I or they, I think that we asked them for another 50,000. So I think they probably would be my large, I have a few contributions at the $50,000 level, including um, American Federation of Teachers National, um, the governor, as you previously mentioned, donated $50,000. And I know the Democratic Lieutenant Governor's Association donated something in that wheelhouse, but I, I uh, that's something that I didn't come to this with, but I, I believe it's probably the Democratic Secretary of State's Association. You're on mute, Rachel. That was on anybody's bingo card. It happened already. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Ms. Parvicini, who's your biggest donor? What do you owe them at this point? We are running a grassroots campaign. We This year, we're not fundraising aggressively. 
Uh, Senator Thatcher. I think at this point, not knowing the numbers exactly, that probably my business is the biggest contributor right now. Um, you know, I've gotten a lot of individual donations under $100, like 13% of my money comes from that. But um, that right now, that's, that's where I see it standing. Senator Fagan, uh, this came up in the primary election endorsement interview. Oh, and Mark disappeared at this key moment. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, you're, you're the largest, I mean, you're, you had uh, very significant um, financial donations from the public employees unions in this state. Uh, and they remain, you know, a sizable chunk of your uh, donor base. Is there anything you can say to us that demonstrates some independence from the public employees? When you say public employee unions, I hear hundreds of thousands of working people across the state who are out battling wildfires, teaching our kids in virtual schools, healthcare workers on the front lines of the COVID crisis. And so I have been consistent that throughout my career from the school board to the house to the senate and now to secretary of state even including it as i mentioned in my own campaign that i believe that when people work they should be paid a living wage they should be have health insurance a secure retirement safe workplace time off for sickness and to care for loved ones and a voice in uh, the administration of their work and so because of those values I have enjoyed support from hundreds of thousands of working people across this state, whether they're part of labor unions or not. But I think what you're really asking me is when I audit state agencies, am I going to make sure to audit, to, to direct the director of the audits division? And of course the audit, auditors themselves are, am I, will I make sure that those are independent, non-biased audits? And of course, and that is the, the auditors in the secretary of state's office they follow national auditing standards and I would not be involved at all in their actual auditing. Um, and I think it's important to note that there is a misconception that frontline workers don't want to be audited. Many of the frontline workers, as because I've spoken of course with many, many of them over the last nine years, they welcome often an auditor because the complaints that they make to the auditor are often the same complaint they have made to their supervisor year after year after year and not gotten heard. And so I think there's a misconception that frontline workers don't want to be audited. Um, they often finally get to express their concerns to somebody who will listen and, and take action. How about the example of foster care? Do you think that is that needs to be audited again? I mean, that's a, that's you know an agency where the governor has changed leadership. Is the problem lower down than the leadership of the organization? If you review the audit that was done by Dennis Richardson, some of the best and most compelling information that he got was from those frontline caseworkers doing the work, talking about how they have too many. Um, children in their portfolio for what is advisable, how they're not able to, you know, do the work they know they want to do because they're overloaded um, from their from their leadership. And I think it's really important. I mean, let me be clear, as somebody who would have been in foster care, but for my dad scraping together a life that he was able to keep my two brothers and me together, because my mom would never have been able to take care of us, leaving behind vulnerable children is unacceptable. That's why in 2013, I supported SB 123, which instituted the Foster Children's Bill of Rights and created a foster care ombudsman. Now that foster care ombudsman is in the, under the executive branch. Um, I certainly, I've reviewed their most recent report in 2019 and I will acknowledge, I did not think it was super heavy on details and their recommendations. And so I think that's a place, certainly the audit that was done by Secretary Richardson needs to be followed up on to make sure um, that these vulnerable children, our most vulnerable children, are getting the support and the, the stability that they need and deserve. And I also think it might be worth it to, in, to audit that foster care ombudsman to make sure that that position is actually functioning as an independent advocate for foster kids uh, that, that I supported and created in Senate Bill 123 back in 2013. Um, 
Thank you, Senator Fagan. Um, so we have a we're we're a bit over the hour. I have a couple more quick questions, and then we'll wrap up. Um, and so, what's your take on the the legal case around redistricting? Do you think that the benchmark for how many signatures that are, should um, required during the pandemic should have been lowered? Should that be on the ballot? this November, um, Ms. Uh, Parvacini. I definitely think that the limit of the, the number of signatures should have been lowered. I think, I think that um, <clears throat> the decision by uh, Attorney General Rosenblum was really uh, unfortunate and um, belies the partisanship that um, prevails in the state and in politics in general in the United States that limit really full expression of voters. Uh, Senator Thatcher, same question to you. I think uh, the problem actually is rooted back in the legislature when they recently um, made it more difficult for online signature gathering and uh, making it more difficult for grassroots groups to get uh, get these measures through and so all right you know right now we have our big money back measures and you know legislative referral um with that particular case i just think that it could have made it to the ballot had we had the legislature left intact the online signature gathering uh, signal signature sheet law so that it would have been easier to put it on the ballot and you, ha you have to remember too that um some people don't like it because they think that people are not getting informed as to what is in the measure, but it has to be printed on that signature, single signature sheet. Um, you know, all the all the captions, all the 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 stuff that's gone through the process, and um, in in analysis analyzing that bill. So, but without Measure Fifty Seven, a Secretary of State could still choose to. Uh, you know, honor the spirit and, and content of what is in the initiative petition 57. And I have promised that I would do that. And uh, so it's not that the law has to change. It's just that the law would change to make that the process. And um, I have committed to adopting that process as much as I can within the Secretary of State's office when I take, when, when if and when redistricting gets to um, the point where the Secretary of State would need to step in. Thank you. I, I have one question that, that's sort of tangential, but I, as, as much as we do everything online these days, then, you know, I'm, I'm sort of baffled that signature gathering isn't allowed online still. Um, but, you know, there are some, there, the, the counter demonstration of like, not being able to gather signatures in a pandemic is the preschool for all measure um, that was put on the Portland ballot. Why, why, why couldn't activists around the state gather signatures like those that a uh, coalition did in Portland? Is it just too onerous statewide to do something like that? Or what, what's your impression of that? You're talking to me. There are a lot of rules surrounding signature gathering, and there are a lot of things that make it difficult for volunteers to do it and um, to do it right. There are a lot of you know things involved there. So, um, I like I said, I think we should be able to be allowed to do the online signature gathering and the the single signature sheets. The signatures on them are highly valid lot more uh, chance of those being valid than the ones on the the big long list that you you know the where many signatures are on a on a sheet so i i'm definitely for making it easier and you know returning oregon to a people driven initiative and referendum process and not uh you know making it more and more difficult and more uh onerous for individual groups and just regular oregonians to get their ideas to the ballot great Senator Fagan, so two questions to you. The original one about, um, you know, whether there should have been a lower bar for for that uh, redistricting ballot measure. 
um, for signature gathering and also the issue of online, you know, electronic or online signature gathering? Should it be easier to gather signatures um, online? Well, be careful what you ask for. I am a bit of a, a this is a place where I'm a real policy nerd, uh, particularly on the IP57. I follow the legal arguments very closely. I, I'm an attorney. First off, I will uh, note this was not a grassroots measure. This was the ultimate big money measure. In fact, that was one of the facts cited by Judge McShane uh, down in the federal court when he allowed it to go forward was how much money they spent and that in any other year he assumed they would have made it to the ballot. So let's be clear, this was the ultimate, this was a, I'm not saying for or against it, I'm just saying it was definitely a measure supported by extraordinary amounts of money from businesses around Oregon. Not to say that's not a reason to support it, I'm just saying this was not a grassroots effort. This was the ultimate big money, big money measure. And the concern I had with the legal analysis um, that eventually was, was, uh, was Judge McShane's was that whether or not the signature gathering requirement should have been lowered or not is a constitutional question. And the plain language of the Oregon Constitution in Article 1, Section 4 says the only way to amend the Oregon Constitution is that you shall return 8%, the number is 8% of the total votes cast in the previous governor's election, which in this case is about 280,000 signatures. Now, the question of should that be lowered would be, should we amend the Oregon constitution to say, or, you know, reasonable diligent effort under certain circumstances, but the constitution does not say that. And that was my concern was that he essentially created this, this, this departure from the Oregon Constitution saying, well, it's a First Amendment right. Well, as we know, not even half of the states in the US have that initiative and petition. So essentially was saying the First Amendment in Oregon is more onerous than the First Amendment in other states. And that's just, you know, it's the Oregon Constitution that allows the initiative and petition. And Article One, Section Four is very clear on exactly how many signatures you have to have. And I believe um, the folks trying to put IP57 on the ballot, despite spending, you know, I don't know, I don't want to say the exact amount, but it was a lot of money. I think they ended up getting around 60,000 signatures. And Rachel, to your point, not only was the preschool for all measure, which I believe, um, you know, some folks voted at the commission to put that on the ballot, um, but also the psilocybin measure, which truly was a grassroots effort, um, made it on the Oregon ballot this time. The Drug Policy Alliance decriminalization ballot measure also was a very grassroots effort. So at the same time that this bigger interest was not allowed or able, uh, was not able to gather the signatures, you had truly smaller grassroots efforts like the psilocybin measure and the Drug Policy Alliance decriminalization measure that both qualified um, for the ballot. So the question of whether or not it should be lowered is a constitutional question. The whether or not it was allowed to be lowered in this instance, which directly went against the Oregon Constitution, which is very clear on the numbers. Um, I think just like I am a fan of you know, I'm a, I'm a pretty big, uh, you know, as an old millennial, I love technology, but I am old school when it comes to voting. That's why I love vote by mail in Oregon. We have a voter trail, we have a paper trail. We don't have internet access uh, voting. And that's one of our safeguards against fraud that was noted in a recent editorial by Bev Clarno and Phil Kiesling when they wrote a joint editorial for the Oregonian. And so taking signature gathering online, uh, I love the accessibility of it but I'm concerned about this for the same reason that we brag about the security of Oregon vote by mail um, being something that has a paper trail, no internet access. Um, you know, the, the, the safeguards around the signature gathering process are to make sure um, that the person signing it is the actual person that they say they are, that they've actually been given an accurate presentation of the measure, particularly at a time when our biggest security threat, and this is directly out of the mouth of Steve Trout, the director of the elections division in the secretary of state's office, is misinformation. And you have misinformation floating around at a time um, when you know you then maybe have online signature gathering. So I would certainly be open to ways to make it accessible, but making sure that we still stick with that Oregon tradition of having a paper trail and of using those safeguards to prevent pro to, that has prevented fraud in Oregon um, in our signature gathering and our vote by mail system for over 20 years for vote by mail. Aaron, can, can I say something about the online signature gathering and clarifying what that means? Sure, go ahead. You 
you have signature sheets you have to print out you have a physical signature this is not just you know being generated by a docusign okay um uh aaron did you want i mean it, it, to be honest like people have brought up to me the fact you can register for register to vote online our information on on registering to vote is online so the argument doesn't quite cohere in my view but aaron did you have a question Oh, I just have the fun question because I'm notoriously fun. <laughs> oh, I thought you had a serious question, but go right. I think we're ready to wrap up. Um, uh, go, go ahead, Aaron. The la the, we have for uh, those who have not been before uh, a Willamette Week editorial endorsement interview, um, we always have a fun question at the end that's at least fun for us. Um, go right ahead. <laughs> I'll Thank start you with for Senator, coming. Start with Senator Fagan. Uh, present company excluded. What's the most awkward Zoom call you've had this year? I'm. I, apologies in advance to my uh, colleagues on here. I may win this one. I was on a Zoom call in my primary. And this is before I came up with a nice little background. Um, of course, if you could see the rest of the room I'm in, it would not look as tidy and clean as the one <laughs> as the background you're seeing. But before I did that, it was in the primary, and I have a very um, overeager puppy who, unbeknownst to me on the Zoom call, had gone in and grabbed a pair of my underwear out of a basket of laundry clean um, and was chewing on underwear on my bed behind me while I was on the Zoom call. As you can imagine, I was horrified and I decided that it was time to come up with a little bit of a better background and, of course, keep the puppy outside when I'm on the Zoom call. Ms. Parvashini, same question. Most awkward Zoom call you've had this year? That is a very unfair question because I do a lot of telemedicine. So I've, I've gone Zoom and telemedicine for close to two years now. So as you can tell, I have a very clean background, a very good video setting. So it's a very unfair question. Fair enough. Uh, Senator Thatcher, most awkward Zoom call. My most awkward Zoom call actually was a very recent one with the Oregonian editorial board. My, <laughs> I the, it, the rain was coming down on my skylight here. I couldn't hear. And then so I tried ear pods and those weren't working right. So I turned them off and then my computer decided to, to uh, my Bluetooth decided to uh, hook up to the AirPods that were in a closed container. So it was like, and then everything just went silent. I'm like, oh crap, I can't hear anybody. <laughs> this is awful. So I think that one by far is my most awkward. <laughs> Thanks. That's it. All right. Thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Um, and we may follow up by phone if we have any other questions. Good luck on the campaign trail. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Have a good day.